the first part of our strategy is um, just getting more distribution for our vaults, right? So like we're continuing to launch products with EtherFi. For the first three weeks of launching the first EtherFi liquid vault, uh, we grew to 400 million in TVL. Uh, we also recently launched with Lombard, which if people don't know is uh, a Bitcoin liquid staking token built on top of Babylon. But we launched a vault with them a couple months ago. Today it's sitting at around 150, a little over 150 million in TVL. So kind of phase one of like the Veda growth plan is really working with different ecosystems and asset issuers uh, to get these products into their users' hands, right? Like we go where the TVL is, we go where the distribution is. And we're really just trying to build this universe of assets that are built on the Veda infrastructure. Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad here with Nomadic from 4RC. Today's show spotlights Veda, the DeFi Earn network designed to make earning passive yield as easy as holding a token. In this episode, we cover Veda's mission to break down the complexities of DeFi and unlock new opportunities on chain, turning yield generation from a complicated art into a simple, secure, and accessible experience. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge Podcast possible. Introducing Redstone, the fastest growing oracle for DeFi. Redstone is the leading oracle for liquid staking and restaking assets, supporting over 60 chains with both the push and pull models. Redstone protects more than $3 billion of total value lock and is trusted by more than 100 clients, including the biggest protocols in DeFi, such as Pendle, Venus, EtherFi, and Athena. The unique modular design of Redstone makes their price feeds available cross-chain, including EVM, non-EVM, roll-up networks, and all types of app chains. Redstone aims to bring the industry forward by supporting upcoming Bitcoin staking tokens and continues to be the number one Oracle provider for liquid staking and restaking tokens. Soon the team will unveil the highly anticipated Redstone token to decentralize the protocol. Learn why Nomadic and I rely on Redstone for our favorite DeFi apps at redstone.finance and join the Redstone expedition today. Power up your portfolio by borrowing, lending, and multiplying your favorite assets. Made safe and easy by the industry-leading automation tools at Summer.Fi. Summer.Fi offers a curated DeFi experience to access the highest quality protocols and strategies. Discover new earned strategies for your portfolio in a user-friendly app designed to filter based on the tokens you hold, the networks you transact on, the protocols you trust, and the highest available yields. Learn more today at summer.fi, the best place to borrow and earn in DeFi. Discover Merlin Chain, the cutting-edge Bitcoin Layer 2, trusted with over $2 billion in total value lock. Merlin revolutionizes Bitcoin by unlocking its true potential with native L1 assets, lightning-fast transactions, and ultra-low fees on an EVM-compatible network. Elevate your Bitcoin experience with Merlin Chain today at MerlinChain.io. All right, let's introduce Sun, the co-founder and CEO of Veda Labs. Sun, welcome to the Edge Podcast. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Big fan of you guys. Thanks so much. Likewise here, and uh, full disclosure too, I'm an investor in Veda, so very uh, excited to have you uh, on board with us today to talk about uh, what I would summarize as the DeFi Earn Network. We're going to talk about how Veda is a key piece of infrastructure for making earning yield simple, transparent, and secure. So Veda is uh, a type of like vault infrastructure, and we're going to break down exactly how that works. But more importantly, the possibilities that it opens for DeFi protocols or even exchanges to take uh, yield and make it as easy as simply holding a token. That said, uh, Sun, why don't we start with a little bit more about your background? This isn't your first rodeo. You've been building this space for many years. Tell us about uh, what you were working on previously and how that led uh, here to Veda. Sure. So I joined the space about three years ago. Um, before that, I was actually about to spend my time as an academic. I was about to start my PhD uh, in machine learning, zero background in like crypto. I wasn't one of those people who, uh, you know, I unfortunately didn't get in super early, didn't like subscribe to Bitcoin thesis or anything like that. But uh, it was like late 2021, obviously like crazy bull market. Um, DeFi was really popping off and a close friend of mine from college entered the space and 
I was already having like second thoughts about going straight to my PhD. I wanted to explore entrepreneurship and like work in industry. And I thought crypto was just like rapidly growing uh, space. So I hopped in. Um, obviously, like uh, that, that growth kind of, you know, stopped. Uh, and we had some of the most brutal uh, years, I think, in crypto's existence. Um, but I definitely was like ideologically bought in through that period. I think there's a lot of value in like building through bear markets. Um, so since I joined, I've been spending, I basically spent all my time building Vault and DeFi. Um, so Vault is this like overloaded term. What does a Vault mean? A Vault is basically a smart contract that um, abstracts away some complex DeFi actions for a user. So a user can deposit their assets into this contract and it's doing a variety of things on that user's behalf. Um, so our team started out in a protocol called Somalia Finance. Some people might be familiar with that. Um, we built like the core smart contract infrastructure. We built all the DeFi strategies there. And over the course of like two and a half years, scaled from zero to like roughly $100 million in TVL. Um, a lot of stuff, you know, we learned a lot of stuff on the way. And VEDA is, uh, represents kind of the evolution of vaults and of DeFi, in my opinion. It's kind of the culmination of our team's background building vaults over the course of years working with a lot of top protocols and a lot of users to understand what their UX needs are. So yeah, VEDA, you know, we launched in March, uh, but it really has been like the work of our core team working together for the past uh, three years or so. Sun, why don't we just start off with you telling us what VEDA is and I guess maybe the mission behind VEDA. Sure. So VEDA is the DeFi Earn Network. Um, what that means is our mission is to make Earn DeFi simple, um, transparent, and secure. There's this like deep technical challenge for how you actually do that. Um, and so what we do is we partner with protocols and ecosystems to build earned products, effectively one-click access into those ecosystems. But we also build the infrastructure that makes those products possible. Sun, maybe let's just start with vaults. I'd love to get kind of your take on why they're so crucial for DeFi. We're seeing, I'd say, like a big resurgence with vaults and, and vault products from, from DeFi teams. We had Tokamak on recently. We talked to uh, Summer Five. They've got a, a vault product coming to market. It just seems like everybody's sort of starting to converge once again on this concept of vaults. But yeah, what's your take on why they're so important and I guess how ultimately they scale both to newcomers and to DeFi crypto natives? Well, maybe I'll start by saying like I hate the term vault. Uh, it's like the industry standard and it's what it's, it's like embedded into the language, uh, that at least people in the know use, but it is like a really bad term for communicating what it actually does. Like it's such a generic term, uh, vault can mean like a million different things, but I think distilling it to this concept of, uh, curation is the, the right perspective. Uh, and that's actually the, the, the broader trend that we're seeing in the market today, which is that DeFi will be curated. Like years ago, there was this view that, um, you know, we can like build these crazy exotic base layer primitives like DEXs and like over collateralized lending markets, CDPs. And maybe there was this like naive optimism that normal people would one day figure out how to use these products. But the reality that I think the industry has learned so far over the last couple of years is that um, there's just some complexity, like there's some irreducible complexity in the base layer protocols. And to build products that are actually consumable by like normal people, you need to abstract away this complexity, right? So there's like layers between DeFi as the core infrastructure and products that people use. And so, you know, what I consider vaults are that middleware infrastructure that allows that kind of intermediation to build consumable and usable products on top of DeFi infrastructure. But the like hard challenge is how do you do that in a way where you don't give up the benefits of DeFi? right? Where you still want these things to be transparent. You, you want to avoid rug risk, right? Custodial risk. Um, so that's kind of the technical challenge that we're focused on is how do you do this intermediation in a way that preserves the benefits of DeFi? In terms of usable products, I think like one of the gold standards in the industry right now is EtherFi liquid vaults. I, this was a part of why EtherFi grew so quickly in like January, February, March of 2024. They went from, I think, less than 100 million in December to like upwards of many billions. And I, I don't know the numbers today, but like it's been six, seven billion dollars of, of Ether that is restaked. A huge part of their success story has been VEDA. Uh, Mike Siligadze, who's been on the podcast before, has 
you know, gone on and on to Nomadic and me about just like what an incredible team uh, you have, you specifically are to partner with. So what can you tell us about, like, how did you land that early win? Uh, maybe to you can just take a step back and, and for folks who don't know Etherfy Liquid Vaults, explain like what that is, how it works, um, and how Veda is, is ultimately powering that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to say on this. And Etherfy has been early and correct on many things that are now just understood as like the correct views on in for, for how you like do a go to market and build a protocol. Uh, so maybe I can start with like a little backstory on like the, how we started working with Etherfy. Uh, first of all, I'm sure most listeners know what Etherfy is. They started as like a restaking protocol on Eigenlayer. And they started at a time, they were, they were the first restaking protocol. And that led to certain advantages, like having, being one of the only ones with withdrawals enabled basically on day one. Um, so they made a lot of correct decisions on their go to market as a restaking protocol, obviously earning the trust of like most of the, uh, people who were de de deploying capital in that space. Um, so today Etherfy has like $7 billion in TVL. They are, you know, by far the largest restaking, uh, protocol on top of Eigenlayer. Um, but they, uh, have many, many more products that they've launched since then. Um, so Etherfy Liquid is effectively uh, a yield aggregator product. Um, what we've partnered with Etherfy to do through Liquid is launch a series of vaults. So again, uh, smart contracts and tokens that allow users to get exposure to different DeFi ecosystems in a really simple way. Um, so we've launched products that are USD denominated, BTC denominated. They are cross-chain. So we've actually built products together where a user can deposit their assets on ETH mainnet and earn yield from different L2s simultaneously. I think that was like a first of its kind product. Um, so maybe a bit about the backstory. Uh, Etherfy Liquid was conceptualized back in March, um, just like a little bit before Etherfy did their TGE. And we didn't have like a prior deep relationship. We'd like work with them a little bit through our, in our days at Somalier. Um, so we're friendly with the team, but they were really looking to partner with like a, an expert vault builder to pioneer this uh, liquid product line. Um, so they considered various options. Uh, we, we met them through, um, you know, some mutual contacts. And uh, I think it was like very obvious that our team uh, was the most serious about security. We had the best track record for operating these things at scale. Um, so it was kind of a no-brainer. And from there, we basically were able to, Veda didn't exist at this point when we first started talking to them. We were just conceptualizing the protocol. And so we showed them the tech and we were like, this is the end game of vault infrastructure. Uh, it made perfect sense to them. And so we were able to have this really, really strong launch for beta um, within the first four weeks, or the first three weeks of launching the first Etherfy Liquid Vault, uh, we grew to 400 million in TVL, which was like, you know, amazing for us, obviously. Um, and what I'll say is since then, Etherfy has been like the perfect partner because uh, because of their views on how a protocol needs to go to market, uh, specifically on vertical integration, right? So there's this idea that um, there's just way too many like neutral base layer protocols, which are like, we will never build products. Uh, we hope users will use our infrastructure because it's the best, but we're very focused on like one thing. Etherfy, I think, has the right view, which is that uh, once you get distribution, once you get users, you need to keep building products to keep them engaged and uh, to keep them committed to your to your protocol, right? And so what that means is starting as a restaking protocol, but offering more and more products. And so we've been, I think, really helpful um, for them to be able to offer this like growing and diverse suite of products. Uh, and it's been perfect for us because they are like the, they totally get the vision. They uh, really like are leveraging our infrastructure to the max. And it's been like this, I think, a really, really great success story for both of us. Yeah, and to kind of hammer that home, uh, your your example about EtherFi, they started as this staking infrastructure, and that's their first product called Stake. They kind of moved up the stack to Liquid that allows users to kind of, I, I think, almost like participate at even more of like a retail level. And then Cash is kind of the top of that vertically integrated stack, which is even more retail friendly and even closer to the customer, and I think has massive p potential for uh, to be like a major product breakthrough finally uh, in crypto. So um, I guess like from that kind of uh, blueprint, like what are you drawing from that as 
you know, it's kind of like similar story here. You're starting as this infrastructure player, but are you kind of taking some of that roadmap that Etherfy's rolled out and like, okay, well, what can we do next to maybe move up our stack, get a little closer to the customer here? Kind of where are you guys going now? Yeah, this is a great like strategic question. So I think the the first thing, the first part of our strategy is um, just getting more distribution for our vaults, right? So like we're continuing to launch products with Etherfy. Uh, we also recently launched with Lombard, which if people don't know, is uh, a Bitcoin liquid staking token built on top of Babylon. Um, they're, you know, one of the, t- one of the best teams in the space. I think they, there's a lot of like hype, uh, rightfully so behind them, but we launched a vault with them a couple months ago today. It's sitting at around 150, a little over 150 million in TVL. Um, so that's, that's also been a really successful partnership. So kind of phase one of like the Veda growth plan is really working with different ecosystems and asset issuers, uh, to get these products into their users' hands, right? Like we go where the TBL is, we go where the distribution is, and we're really just trying to build this universe of assets that are built on the VEDA infrastructure. Um, now, what you can do once there exists a universe of tokens, uh, yield-bearing tokens built on VEDA, I think that's where there's some like really interesting opportunities. Um, so one thing is like creating some sort of shared liquidity uh, between these assets. I think that's... Uh, that's something we're thinking about. Another thing is just like having a distribution channel through the Veda app where people can explore different opportunities, right? Like if you, if the, the way we like to think of Veda is you take an ecosystem and you encapsulate it in a token, right? So a lot of our products with EtherFi are you take parts of the EtherFi ecosystem and you represent it with a token. But where, you know, with Lombard, you take the LBTC Lombard Bitcoin ecosystem and you encapsulate it with a token. Uh, as we get these different like ecosystems that are represented by a vault or token, um, I think there's a lot of value in like having a shared uh, dashboard or shared like marketplace where people can discover new opportunities and move between existing opportunities. Um, so yeah, definitely like we want to try to get closer to the user to some extent, but really our core focus today is like working with the top asset issuers and protocols uh, to like get our infrastructure and our products into their users' hands. If you're a DeFi protocol, maybe like walk us through a, a perfect setup for them to use VEDA. You know, you're offering whatever sort of yield or you've got, let's say like an LRT, like EETH. Just walk us through some examples of like the struggles of like what it looks like today versus where they could be if they were to work with VEDA and integrate all of that technology stack? Yeah, great question. So I'll, I'll go over two like canonical examples. Uh, one of them, let's just take like an LST or an LRT or even a stable coin issuer. Um, when you're issuing like a DeFi native asset or even if just a crypto asset in general, one of the core challenges is building uh, liquidity on chain, right? It's one of the, you know, arguably Lido's success and their defensibility is a result of Steeth being everywhere, Right. It's one of the most liquid assets. It's in every single lending market. Uh, it's widely available on many different L2s. And that's kind of the North Star for asset issuers. The challenge is how do you get there from day one? How do you build liquidity and build utility? One, in an efficient way that doesn't like cause you to burn a lot of money. Um, and two, in like a, a competitive way, right? Because you're, you're generally competing with other comparable asset issuers. Like the LRT wars, for example, were really, really heated back in the day. Uh, and liquidity was one of the core metrics that users used to differentiate, right? It's like, okay, I don't really know the difference between these two LRTs, but one of them has way more liquidity. So that makes me like feel safer, right? But liquidity meaning like DEX liquidity. Um, so what VEDA can do, VEDA is effectively like um, a way to supercharge your liquidity and utility in DeFi. Um, so I'll, we'll go with Lombard as an example. Uh, we were live with them almost on day one. Um, and since then, just over the past couple months, we've been able to create tens of millions of dollars of DEX liquidity, and this is efficient liquidity on Uniswap V3. Um, what that facilitates is Oracle integrations. It allows the asset to be integrated into different lending protocols and yield trading platforms like Pendle. Um, but then we go one step further with our Veda Vault. Um, users who deposit in the Veda Vault, they're also earning yield from these new DeFi opportunities as they come out. Right. So Pendle is one of the, I think, the best yield uh, sources in DeFi. And so we have this single vault with Lombard that not only creates DEX liquidity for them, 
but also offers a passive way for their users to get exposure to these DeFi protocols. Um, so this is what I mean by encapsulating an ecosystem in a token. Um, so that's one thing. You're an asset issuer. You want to build utility. You want to offer a passive way for you, your users to get exposure to your, these DeFi integrations. Uh, another kind of canonical example, which we're, we're uh, like, we should have some news coming out fairly soon, uh, is working with L2s. Um, so L2s, uh, you know, I, I think I have a lot of thoughts on like what a winning strategy for L2s looks like uh, in this day. And the winning strategy is not just like build another generic general purpose DeFi L2 and hope users come. Like I think Arbitrum is fairly ahead with that. Base obviously has done a great job with their like distribution canon. Um, but specifically, like ideally, if you're, if you're an L2, ideally you have novel protocols and apps that have launched on your chain, right? That's one core way you differentiate, which is do things that are exclusive and um, like only, a, only able to be built on your chain. The challenge with that is that if you have protocols that aren't just like an Aave fork or Uniswap fork, very few people will know how to use these protocols, right? So there's almost this trade-off between like you want to encourage novelty and you want to encourage uniqueness, but it comes out a trade-off of usability. Um, so what Veda can enable is one-click access into this unique ecosystem on an L2, right? So you can imagine an L2 offering a product with Veda um, that is passive for users. Users just deposit their assets, but that capital is now being efficiently deployed across these interesting protocols. It can be directed based on the L2's goals. So if they want to, you know, uh, prioritize specific protocols, if they want to use that liquidity to attract new builders, they can do that. Um, so yeah, I think this is like the two of the, the core use cases for Veda. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, you've mentioned L2s. Can you remind us, who does Veda support in terms of networks? Uh, we know Ethereum mainnet, but what L2s do you already support? And then like, do you support anything outside of the EVM, like like a Solana? Yeah, um, so EVM world, obviously we're on mainnet. We support Arbitrum, Base, uh, Optimism, most of the super chains really, because those are all similar from an integration perspective, but also like, you know, Linea, Scroll, Mantle, those are a couple of other ones. Um, we're really just driven by like product demand. So as soon as we have user demand for supporting NUL2, it's pretty easy for us to add it. Now, Alt EVM is something that uh, we should have some interesting stuff coming out soon. There's nothing... There's nothing specific to like our infrastructure at Veda that restricts us to the EVM. It's just like taking our core smart contracts and even our off-chain stack and deploying that on Solana, for example. Um, so yeah, I can say that Veda will have a presence on Solana uh, fairly soon. It may not be like within a month, but it's definitely something we're looking at, especially as that like DeFi ecosystem heats up. Before we get back to the show, we wanted to share a quick update from our sponsor at Mantle. Metamorphosis Season 2 is live, so now's your chance to restake your meth for CMeth and unlock new rewards on both Mantle and Ethereum networks. With CMeth, you can earn yields from staking and restaking protocols, plus powder for cook rewards, all while staying flexible across your favorite DeFi integrations. You can start your restaking journey today at meth.mantle.xyz slash restake. And special thanks to the Mantle community for supporting us here at the Edge podcast and the Edge newsletter. And then Sun, what do you think still needs to happen to, to bring these Web2 users into this space and to be able to access these yields? Because I think the yields are starting to get close to mature enough where some you, you can start to find some stable yields from good sources that like we trust um, and they're more made up of like this native yield rather than completely incentivized by you know native tokens, points completely. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the question is like how how do you actually bring those users in or do you even think we're ready for that yet? Yeah, so I, I definitely think we're ready, actually. Uh, there's been this like sentiment going around, which I, I personally agree with, that the infrastructure is ready. Like it hasn't been, you know, it's, it's a new, something new that the DeFi infrastructure is ready. Uh, so I think there's two things that need to happen to actually get mass uh, adoption of DeFi. The first is that you do need the infrastructure, right? Like you need uh, pro DeFi protocols that are robust, battle-tested, um, have like ideally um, existed through multiple cycles. Um, but you also need that intermediation infrastructure that I talked about, right? Which is like 
uh, li- how you abstract these protocols and, and produce products. The other thing you need is uh, consumer-focused DeFi founders. Um, I think we, there's been way too many just like base layer protocols, uh, which are people who want to be like neutral in the sense that neutral, uh, in my opinion, just means like you aren't building for users. You're just building like from a tech perspective. Um, and so I think that like we are starting to see a cohort of consumer focused DeFi founders who recognize that the infrastructure is ready uh, and are even willing to like build, like develop that infrastructure. Uh, but who are focused on like distilling the best parts of DeFi and making that available. Um, so I think we're, I think I'm, I'm very bullish on that right now. I think EtherFi is like one great example of a very, very consumer focused uh, protocol. But there's also like, you know, Infinex is another one that like I think is really exciting. So we're seeing, we're seeing this play out. Like I think we're, we are at the precipice of um, teams that are actually have what it takes to take a lot of the value that we've collectively created in DeFi and bring that um, to users. Sun, we, we saw what played out with Ethereum liquid restaking, and it seems like that is still in its infancy with the Bitcoin ecosystem. Just curious, like somebody with your perspective, um, how big do you think the Bitcoin restaking space can get? Do you think it could be something that compares with the Ethereum restaking space in size? I, I definitely think... Um... Yeah, I definitely think it could be, it could be comparable. Um, like the interesting thing with with Bitcoin, first of all, there's some like structural dynamics that are very different with Bitcoin. Uh, specifically, like I think the holder base tends to be a lot more concentrated. Uh, like there's a couple of like like whales or cartels or whatever you want to call them that control a lot of the Bitcoin. So I think part of the adoption story will require buy-in from some of these larger institutions and large Bitcoin holders. But what we've seen with Babylon and the Bitcoin, a lot of the Bitcoin LSTs, is that there is meaningful demand for uh, Bitcoin yield, right? Like there are, there is a non-trivial subset of holders who are looking, who are willing to deploy their capital into DeFi to some extent. Now, there's a spectrum here, right? Like staking your Bitcoin with Babylon is kind of one level of risk. Bringing that into DeFi and deploying it into DeFi protocols and l- lending markets and things like that is another level. Um, but I think there's this clear trend and clear demand. And, you know, we can see this from Coinbase with their CVBTC product as well. That was one of the most successful launches I've ever seen, um, especially if you compare that to like, um, you know, CBE in DeFi. I think like day one, um, I was watching these markets very closely. Uh, day one, there were tens of millions of dollars of liquidity um, on DEXs, both on base and on mainnet. Uh, you you could see with Ave as soon as they opened their CBBTC caps, that capital that those caps were immediately flooded and filled, and so yeah, I'm I'm pretty bullish on DeFi on on Bitcoin DeFi specifically. I think that uh, it's clear that there's demand for this now. What this will scale to? Will a trillion dollars of Bitcoin come on chain? I think that's uh that's a harder question, and it'll be a really long time to for that to play out. But uh, there's definitely billions of dollars with demand for for yield on Bitcoin. Say hello to Puffer Unify. Puffer Finance is expanding beyond native liquid restaking with new products such as Unify based rollup and Unify pre confirmations AVS. Unify is not just another L2. Unify is a based rollup, one that will solve L2 issues such as slow withdrawals versus instant withdrawals with Puffer Unify. Puffer Unify is fast capable of sub-second transactions. Unify also has boosted puffer points, which means if you bridge assets, you earn boosted puffer points and rewards from dApps on Unify. Puffer's core products mean a bright future for Ethereum. Puffer Unify will launch in November 2024. Learn more at puffer.fi. Sun, switching gears here, we're seeing the AI agent meta return a lot to, to DeFi and, and crypto more broadly with this like truth terminal coming out, uh, virtuals.io launched this, uh, you know, uh, thing called Luna who's talking on Twitter all day as well. And then we know the parallel parallel team are working on Wayfinder. So just kind of curious your perspective on kind of this clash of AI and crypto. And is this even something that Veda is looking into or taking seriously to maybe integrate into your own products yeah this, so there's a this is this is another great topic there's a spectrum here right there's like the left curve stuff is definitely these like ai meme coins 
which I'm definitely long. I'm like a huge, I think the story of goat and truth terminal is one of the like most interesting, like backstories and narratives for a meme coin. You have this like, like, you know, jailbroken AI agent that's like a KOL on CT and shilling its coin. Um, and is now like a millionaire or like a deca millionaire, I think recently, I think it's just like a, an amazing, uh, a story for a meme coin on the other side, like really right curve stuff is, um, you know, like real use cases and real, real intersections between AI and crypto, which there's like inference, like decentralized inference, decentralized training. Um, I think the overlap with Veda specifically and bringing this back to vaults is that my expectation is potentially in the near future, um, it will be algorithms that do this intermediation. So specifically, like you need this layer that is uh, abstracting over different DeFi protocols, uh, whether that's like doing portfolio allocations or like risk management uh, and offering that product to users. I think that that infrastructure layer will be heavily, heavily driven by AI. Uh, and there's reasons that I think this will happen in DeFi first, even before traditional finance. Uh, one of the core ones being that all of the data is open in DeFi. And it's permissionless to transact. So it very much lends itself to AI agents uh, taking action on behalf of users, whether that's like intent fulfillment or portfolio optimization. Uh, it might be a while. I think people will take some time to actually fully trust uh, agents autonomously. But for a protocol like Veda, what that means is as we build our DeFi strategies and our vault infrastructure, uh, we can increasingly integrate AI agents into that process. Um, so it's not going to be a zero to one thing. There will be like kind of a curve of adoption. Um, but I think already today, uh, AI agents are useful in, in a lot of these things. So interesting. Uh, Sun, I want to talk about modularity and like how that fits into the uh, the roadmap for, for VEDA. So uh, I think it's fair to say uh, VEDA's uh, yield layer or DeFi earn network, it, it clearly emphasizes modularity. Can you explain... How does that create opportunity for, you know, new protocols and assets to be supported? Uh, also, maybe you could even take a step back and just talk about, like, what does that modularity mean to VEDA and to the product? Like, how does that ensure that VEDA as a product stays relevant? Yeah, so modularity, I guess, uh, can mean a lot of different things. Uh, the, I think the most relevant definition is uh, we are going to live in a multi-chain future. I think that is, like, clear. Um, and we can see that because like a lot of the top crypto brands and projects, even just today it was announced that, uh, Kraken is launching an L2. We're just seeing, we're just seeing tons of, um, like really blue chip companies coming and wanting to build their own chains. We're also seeing apps move to launching their own chains. Um, so multi-chain world, that's one, one piece of modularity. Um, like I also think we'll live in a multi-asset world. Uh, this might be, sound fairly obvious, but. I think that we're just now scratching the surface of the types of assets that live on chain, right? Like the largest assets, there's like ETH and LSTs and Bitcoin. Um, but we are, we still haven't like broken through to actually tokenizing really, really interesting things and bringing them on chain. People are starting to do it. Like, um, you know, story, story protocol, for example, is tokenizing IP. Uh, but the point is when we live in a world that has many different chains and many different assets, that is even more complicated, right? Like it is even more essential in that world where you have companies and you have protocols that are abstracting over all of the different Legos that exist, plugging them in and uh, basically distilling that value for users to consume. So like, uh, you know, one of our, this is like kind of core to the reason we think Veda is something useful to build. It's that as DeFi grows, we think it'll continue to increase in complexity. Uh, because there's going to be more assets, there's going to be more de like primitives and protocols, there's going to be more chains. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's really, really bullish for our story. Uh, and this is, this is what like, um, you know, interoperability really means. It's like, we, we need to build for a world where different participants can like express their own worldview, whether that's launching their own chain or launching their own asset. But, uh, you know, how does a user deal with that? Um, and that's, that's really kind of the goal for Veda. It's to make that really easy to, to abstract over all these complex Legos. Sun, can you just dive a little bit deeper on interoperability? Like, how does that impact the, the roadmap for Veda products? 
I think maybe they're like, if there is like more nuance to it, and this is like another trend with Infinex, I think as like, is, is, is talking about this a lot, but um, they're like, the interoperability doesn't need to be solved on chain. Um, that's, that's maybe like a misconception. First of all, bridging sucks today, obviously. Like for, for a normal person, uh, figuring it out, it's like you want to pull your hair out and it's super stressful, right? Because you don't know if you like are getting your funds or not. Um, but that being said, like it is, it is secure. Like you can securely bridge uh, if you have the technical ex- expertise to like know how to use these systems. So I think that like this ties back to the point of in- the infrastructure being ready. The infrastructure is not ready for like a normal person to use it. But what you can do is move the abstraction and the interoperability off chain uh, and effectively abstract that away from users, right? So like if you can create a secure bridging experience or a yield experience that's cross chain where uh, users don't even have to see it necessarily, but they know that it's happening securely and transparently, uh, I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm like very influenced by like what uh, Kane and Infinex have been doing, which is you can actually, if you are willing to build stateful apps, that you move a lot of the stuff off chain. You keep the financially sensitive stuff on chain, but you you can do anything you want off chain to offer a better user experience. So uh, yeah, I think that like uh, yeah, that those are my thoughts. Guys, this has been an awesome conversation. I think this is a good place for us to start to close out. So. I want to remind our listeners they should learn more about Veda by going to uh, veda.tech. They should follow Veda underscore labs on Twitter or X. Follow uh, Sun's handle. It's here. It's S-U-N-A-N-D-R underscore. We'll put that into our show notes so you can easily reference it. And otherwise, Sun, thanks so much for coming on. Again, like really just a, a compelling story about a team that has found product market fit, uh, has the background to have been building this space for years. And I really look at your success as it's very bootstrapped. Like there's no like easy route to what you've accomplished. That said, like with partners like EtherFi that you found so much success with, you know, there's so many more yield products for for Veda to power. Uh, So anyways, any final word for us or any like call to action for folks to get involved with Veda? Thanks for having me. This was a great conversation. Um, what I'll say is it's going to be, uh, we're still going to be building through the end of this year. We have a lot of exciting news coming out, I think, in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, just follow us on Twitter. And um, I think you'll be surprised by some of the stuff that we're going to be launching. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And to stay up to date with future episodes, plus get expert tips, strategies, and exclusive content, subscribe to our free newsletter at the-edge.xyz. Hold up. 